I'm absolutely delighted to be invited to join this festive symposium. I have dressed for the future. I've got my Star Trek t-shirt on um, because I think like a lot of people this year, that's the period of history I'd most like to live in at the moment. Um, okay, so the bit of Shakespeare's speech that I'm kind of responding to with this talk is the childhood section. Shakespeare wrote, and then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face creeping like a snail unwillingly to school. School. not as beautiful a reading as we had this morning. Um, and I wanted to consider one particular reason why we might see this kind of reluctance to go to school um, uh, among young people, which is obviously still so resonant today. And that might be because they have additional support needs of various kinds or special educational needs as they're known in England. So um, we know that the school experience for these young people is pretty um, tough and it extends way beyond the specific areas affected, learning areas directly affected by their diagnosis. So young people experience increased bullying and victimization, reduced classroom participation, much higher rates of exclusion. Um, that's depicted in the graph on the right here. This is our own analysis of millennium cohort data you can see increased rates of exclusion in the blue bars for all of the learning difficulties groups that we looked at, particularly group two, which was ADHD and related uh, difficulties. So here we've got these um, exclusion rates, right, with the higher rates in the blue bars associated with learning difficulties. So in a nutshell, um, additional support needs or special educational needs are associated with educational inequalities that extend far beyond the direct learning difficulty that's, um, that's associated with the diagnosis. Um, there are long-term consequences of these difficulties and they affect 20 to 30% of children in mainstream schools. So this is both serious and widespread. And I think we've tried various solutions to this kind of problem to resolve these difficulties. So one is the idea that a diagnostic label might unlock understanding and support in the classroom. Um, but actually, if you talk to teachers, for example, they frequently tell us how out of depth they feel when it comes to diagnostic labels, unsure about the correct way to respond to having an autistic child or a child with ADHD in their class. Parents are frequently frustrated by the lack of support provided um, following a diagnosis. So it looks like diagnostic labels alone, while perhaps an important part of the puzzle, are not producing this kind of magical solution that we might hope. And nor is the inclusion agenda, which is intended to sort of raise expectations and help people fulfill their potential by bringing people into mainstream classrooms but in fact is resulting in some of the difficulties that I mentioned on the first slide around mental health, bullying, and so on. And so into the fray charged the developmental cognitive neuroscientists, people like me saying, don't worry, what I'll do is I'll analyze everything at the cognitive level or the neural level. And what I'll find is a core deficit and a neural substrate to go with it that explains all of that diagnostic diversity and experiential profile in a kind of single explanatory route. And once we have that single explanation, then we'll be able to do something helpful. But actually this process is really not working either. So there are data here on the right from Duncan Astle's lab, um, recently published in Current Biology, which is a particularly good example um, of a kind of challenge to this assumption. So what these data are showing in the kind of yellowish dots are a cognitive space derived from um, analysis of the cognitive profiles of a very large diverse sample of children. And overlaid on that, we've got the diagnostic labels of the children that weren't used to derive those cognitive profiles, but were placed over the cognitive um, space at the end of the study. And essentially that you can see for any particular diagnostic group, for example, the ADHD group, children are represented in every part of the cognitive space. So they're in the bottom left-hand corner where children have very few cognitive difficulties. They're in the top right corner where children have multiple difficulties across all the different things that uh, Duncan and his team measured. And they're in the spaces in between that represent kind of more verbal challenges or more non-verbal challenges and so on. And it's the same pattern for all of the diagnostic groups that they looked at. So in other words, what these data are showing us is that while we can derive cognitive profiles that have a kind of internal consistency, and we can also do the same with neural profiles looking at um, connectivity, 
these don't map onto each other, the cognitive and the neural profiles don't, and they also don't map onto diagnostic label. And so our efforts to understand um, the diversity of kind of diagnostic profiles at a cognitive or a neural level is not really working. It's certainly not providing us with that kind of complexity down to simplicity mapping that a lot of our theories rely on. So let's look again a little bit more at those kind of core deficit theories and why they've been so persistent, even though lots of people, I'm certainly not the only one, have been saying for a long time that they're not really sufficient to capture developmental processes and complexity of profile. And I think a big reason comes down to the method methodological limitations in the literature. We're reliant still on case control designs with selective samples that tend often to have low power, um, partly as a function of that selectiveness, the, the application of very strict inclusion or exclusion criteria. There's also a circular logic often to our selection of measures. So if I'm doing an autism study, I'll measure theory of mind. If you're doing a, an ADHD study, you'll measure executive functions. And we don't necessarily kind of cross pollinate those measures as well as we should. There's still a historic influence of adult psychopathology on our neuroimaging studies. In particular, with some honorable exceptions, there's a real dearth of longitudinal neuroimaging data and as a result, a kind of failure to capture developmental processes at the neural level. And I think also there's an element of publication bias where the pathway to publication may be a little bit smoother for someone who is aligned with one of these kind of influential theoretical models. We can look at this phrase core deficit in two parts, and I think we can chart then false assumptions underlying both parts of it. So, Core, I've already kind of explored a little bit, you know, the idea that everyone within a diagnostic group is similar in some sort of simple or fundamental way, that exploring this cognitive or neurocognitive level provides some sort of explanatory power, and that if we can then address that level, we'll have downstream effects on behaviour. That's borne out by vanishingly little hard data. But I think we can also challenge the deficit part of this um, framing. So the idea that diagnostic groups who experience many challenges, I've highlighted them on my very first slide, but the idea that those groups are best defined by those challenges and that diagnostic categories represent a deviation from the ideal and therefore that the correct response to those diagnostic groups is to correct the developmental pathway back onto the typical pathway. So what's the alternative to these sorts of approaches? I think we need to be prepared in developmental cognitive neuroscience to examine the assumptions, constructs, and evidence base on which all of those rest. In particular, obviously, we need to be generating new data using open science and with, a, with paying attention to replicability of those studies, trying to uh, recruit large and diverse samples. But also because that's very, very difficult to do, I understand, I think we could work better collectively to harmonize our protocols and facilitate meta-analysis across studies. I also think small data approaches still have a lot of value. We can use clever experimental designs, qualitative data to capture lived experience and make sure that our questions are motivated by people's real world experiences and also work more on implementation co-designing with the community, helping people develop their advocacy skills and their empowerment. So just to finish with one specific example of this in action, this is the Neurodiversity in Schools project or LEANS, learning about neurodiversity at school. And what we're doing here is creating a resource pack for teachers to teach primary school children about the concept of neurodiversity. This basically is the fact that everybody's brains are different. But a corollary of that is that these differences give rise both to the individual subtle differences between people, but also categorical diagnostic differences and indeed disabilities. So the consequences of those differences can be disabling. So importantly, the neurodiversity approach doesn't deny disability or difficulty. It acknowledges it and names it and references it, it and gives people the tools for having a conversation about the ways in which we're different and how we can create a classroom that then facilitates those differences. So we think by implying this, we can bring the whole class into learning and thinking about neurodiversity, increase the sense of a shared responsibility and a shared benefit, whether you have or don't have a diagnosis for pupils and teachers alike. 
And our hope is that we'll be able to create a more flexible learning environment where people get what they need when they need it, rather than having it gated by a particular diagnostic label. So just to recap, children with additional support needs make up 20 to 30% of our mainstream classes. They face quite serious educational inequalities that extend far beyond the specific learning area affected by their particular condition. Attempts to solve this problem via neuropsychological explanatory frameworks, I think are not succeeding very well. And we need new approaches and theoretical frameworks to serve the needs of this community. I believe that neurodiversity provides a platform for understanding how to talk about diversity in neurodevelopment and provide support on an equity basis rather than on an equality kind of one size fits all within a diagnostic group basis. That's it. Thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs>